And welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we dig in deep to analyze the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. I'm Andy Nelson from thenextreel.com. And I'm Pete Wright, still from The Next Reel. We're at the beginning of the whole MCU ride, looking at John Favreau's 2008 film, Iron Man. And back with us today, we have Rick and Julia Ingham from Mad Max Minute. Welcome back. Thank you for having us back. Yeah, good to be back. We're ready to lay on the accelerator for this minute. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and you promised us, you promised us your rant. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, On today's minute, we're looking at minute 107. Uh, we, the minute starts with Jarvis talking low power with Tony, and it ends with Obadiah telling Tony that nothing's going to stand in his way, hmm. least of all him. Oh, he's so threatening in that deep robo voice of his. But we're starting this minute. Uh, I, I think that we're, uh, this should be a good time for your rant. We have Tony. He's, he's doing his best to hold up this car as his power is dwindling and Jarvis reminds him so. He puts the car down as the as the mom driving floors it, and he uh, he's trying desperately to hold on, uh, claws across the uh, the front uh, front of the car, and then gets sucked underneath until he finally pushes it off of him, and she drives oh away. Gosh. This is so incredibly frustrating to me because <laughs> now I can understand a little bit of panic. Um, actually, no, I can understand a lot of panic, but you're. Up off the ground, you're being tossed around by what look like robots. And why is her first instinct to lay on the accelerator like there's no tomorrow? It makes zero sense to me. And as we see, you know, Tony's power is slowly draining from that suit. He has to take a knee in order to stay upright. And then as he lowers the car down, those tires connect, first of all. I would expect a, something like that to be front wheel drive, but hey, I guess it's rear wheel drive. Um, but that one action, they take off like a rocket and whatever kind of damage has already been inflicted to that vehicle is now added to by the fact that Tony is attached to the front of that car and he's hanging around the front. It's not like he can crawl out effectively and just fly away from the front. He's be- getting pulled by the road and pulling on the hood he's putting deep scratches in here and i'm like if the lady had just not like if she had just not (laughs) done what she did it would have been so much easier for literally everybody and it frustrates me to no end that her first and only (laughs) instinct is to lay on the accelerator like no tomorrow and i'm like this is the epitome of a driver with no chill and it (laughs) bothers me so much. That's so funny because I love it. <laughs> I, think it's, I, think it's, I, I think it's one of the funniest things in the movie. I don't know why it just cracks me up because it's like, you know, this panic mom, like she's got her kids in the car and she just floors it. She's got being attacked by like robot monsters from outer space is probably what's going through her mind. And she's just like in panic mode, like retreat, get me out of here as fast as I can. <laughs> And just, it you know, doesn't care about anything except escape. And I, I don't know. It makes me laugh every time I see this, this person strikes me as, or this lady strikes me as the kind of person who would see an animal crossing the road, freak out, and then just go faster and cause a bigger accident. And speed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the never meet your heroes kids moment, right? Like, I know it's Iron Man. I'm still going to run over him. I don't care. <laughs> Terrifying. Like, how are those kids going to be on Monday when they go into school? Oh, hey, how was your weekend? Uh, fine. You know, we went to the park. How was your weekend? Our mom ran over Iron Man in her car. <laughs> <laughs> will that make the kids cool or will it make them uncool? Because who in their right mind would think to run over Iron Man? Well, if the kids are smart, they would phrase it like, I met Iron Man. Uh, okay. Uh, right. <laughs> Iron Man saved you me. Him? Oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they'd probably be they'd probably have a lot easier time being believed than that one kid from the Ferris wheel who had the ice cream cone and he saw Tony flying around in that first flight test yeah. and he dropped his ice cream. No one's going to believe that kid. No, that kid's a pariah. Yeah, yeah nobody believes that kid. He had to change schools. <laughs> 
especially because he's like the only kid who saw him when he was in the Mark II suit. You know, he was all silver, I swear. Right. It's like, right. what are you talking Tony about? Tony makes a liar out of everybody <laughs> now. Uh, quick question, though. When Tony was flying to the factory from his home, Jarvis st- said that they're starting at 49% power. Is that right? Uh, right. Like, they're pretty low. So already. flying from... Malibu to the factory and then using the chest beam has taken out 30% of the total power. He, yeah, he's burning through it pretty quickly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's very interesting. I and mean, we're going to talk about a lot of power loss over the rest of the week because we basically see him over the course of this week. He's he's going to go from where he is now at this 19% to 0% pretty much. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it's it's interesting how quickly it, he lost that huge chunk of power flying, and now he's uh, it's it's you know it goes much slower now. Goes much slower. When he first created this particular arc reactor back in the cave, he said that it could power something really big for fifteen minutes. So on the yeah. scale of arc reactors, it's not that powerful, especially what he's doing. He already he right. already used up a bunch of it flying to the factory and then the chest beam thing. Yeah, I don't think when he was putting it together in the cave, he was thinking, oh, I could fire a giant laser out of this thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was the furthest thing from his mind. Yeah. And I mean, they, they supposedly will rejuvenate their power, but it's not like he's giving it a chance to. I mean, he's using it constantly. Like in every second that we're watching these minutes, he's just it's all being used up. So, I, yeah, I have no idea. No idea. I, I did want to point out as as uh, we have our uh, everybody's favorite mom driving away as and she goes over Tony. Did you guys notice the uh, the street sign that they pass? <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I love Howard the little Stark nod. Memorial Parkway. Oh my god! I I'm just now seeing that. Yeah, yeah never noticed that. <laughs> well, it makes sense because they're right close to the uh, Stark factory. Yeah, exactly. Us. It's interesting that it's a, um, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember the logic, but it's a brown sign. And my recollection, or maybe it's green, it's just really dark, but I thought it was a brown one. And I thought that was like, uh, like uh, you know, state parks or other types of places, whereas the green ones were typically like for roads and whatnot. Yeah. I think you're right. I'm not yeah. going to fight you on it. <laughs> <laughs> But it is nice. Howard Stark Memorial Parkway next exit. Nice little touch. We get back to the next scene right after that exit, and we have another nod to our very favorite uh, mega chemical corporation. Uh, the giant building in the background is Roxxon again. So they have trucks driving around from the last minute, and now there's their uh, uh, head- Los Angeles headquarters. Yeah, and as I was mentioning yesterday, it's a different uh, logo than what we saw. This X, the way that these two X's are designed, it's kind of an interesting split where one line is kind of connecting the two X's, whereas yesterday it was like the two X's were almost on top of each other. It's got a very Exxon Mobil feel to it. Yeah, which which I, I think Roxxon was very much designed that way in the comics initially. So it's kind of fun. That's actually the California Bank and Trust building in the back that we're looking at that has been rebranded this way. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Roxxon history? I don't have we talked a lot about Roxxon on the show. I missed some weeks, but um, I, I don't think that has been a big deal here. Well, Roxxon, I mean, it hasn't come up on the show because this is, I mean, these past two days are the first time that uh, we've seen anything with Roxxon. Right. Um, it's it's just this company that's been in the comics for quite a long time in a variety of different ways. The company was actually one of the early funders of S.H.I.E.L.D. way back in the beginning, but they also were tied in with Hydra. They smuggled weapons for them in their tanker trucks. And and so there's all sorts of stuff. It's been kind of this way from the beginning. It's kind of this dark type of company. I I think uh, they were involved with like the Serpent Squad and the Serpent Crown and all sorts of different things involved with this company that's been kind of a thread through a variety of the comics um, and different characters. But it always is kind of being portrayed as kind of this dark, malevolent uh, oil company. Right, right. I, I You see a lot of it right now in uh, Marvel's Cloak and Dagger, which is um, a 
deceptively good show. And, and so, you know, the whole thing centers around Roxxon and what this company had done. I was not aware that in the Iron Age storyline, it was agents of Roxxon that killed Tony Stark's parents. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, you know, having the nod to Roxxon here is at least Iron Man appropriate, if not completely Marvel. Yeah. And one thing that stands out to me about Roxxon is that in, I think it's the second season of the Peggy Carter show, when she moved from the New York office of the SSR over to the LA office of the SSR, Roxxon was very much involved in the um, storyline involving the, was it like a ghost thing or a goo thing? It was some sort of weird, right. it's been a while since I've right. seen it. Yeah, the, the, uh, I, I don't remember the, the specific, I'd say it's all coming back to me now, but that was in, that would have been in ni- the 19, uh, late 30s, early 40s, yeah. right? Uh, and according to the the fictional company history, it was founded in 1932 and has been kicking around, you know, early Captain America in 74. So been around a long time. Yeah. So we go from uh, from that moment of of uh, Obadiah kind of uh, doing it. Well, you brought this up yesterday, those great little boot thrusters that he's using to kind of jump over the cars and, and to catch up with Tony. It's a great shot. And then this is really where we begin uh, the let's torture Tony for a while uh, <laughs> section. <laughs> he grabs this motorcycle as uh, out from under the, the rider as he's passing by and uses it to smack Tony across the divider onto the other side of the highway into a car. And then he jumps after him and he kicks him and he uh, you know, turns around and, and stomps on him and uh, throws him into the ground and then uh, picks him up and throws him into the bus. It's a very abusive (laughs) chunk of time that we go through right here. I think with any action scene, you have to have at least a little bit of time devoted to your hero getting beat up a bit to establish the stakes. I'm thinking specifically um, to in Mad Max Fury Road when Max is first fighting Furiosa after they pass through the toxic storm. There's a good part of that fight where Max is on the defensive and Furiosa is coming at him fast and hard. And it's only, an, and it's like a minute and a half into the fight before Max actually gets a chance to fight back. Right. And that's exactly, I mean, it's, and I think it speaks very much to kind of cinematic and storytelling formula where, in or you don't just want your good guy to kind of arrive and win, right? You need to kind of have them uh, really have to struggle to get to that point. And we see a lot of the struggle here because Tony is just getting clobbered. And I think it's a good way to also just show that this ironmonger suit that Obadiah and his scientists have built down in Section 16, I mean, he did kick it up a notch. I mean, it's it's a very powerful suit. And at this point, it seems much more powerful than uh, what Tony has put into his Mark III suit. Yeah, and they had already done a, an ample job of handicapping Tony by, again, this constant refrain to power levels. And now we're taking those power levels that were already constrained, and now we're beating the crap out of him. <laughs> My favorite uh, little effect of this sequence is when Obadiah grabs the motorcycle out from under the rider and hits him with it. I think that is uh, a delightfully and a vicious kind of smack. Uh, that even though I, I sort of find the, the CG a little bit 2008 questionable, uh, it, it is very viscerally satisfying. Yeah, along those same lines, and I guess also with the car, with the family in it that he picked up, and his comment about collateral damage, his idea of collateral damage, at least in this fight, is going out of his way almost to hurt people. To hurt civilians, right. Yeah, like collateral damage is supposed to be the unavoidable consequences of, you know, getting the bad guy. And no, what he's doing is not collateral damage. What he's doing is disregard for the public. Yeah. Well, yeah, and insofar he's cementing his his madness, right? That descent into madness we talked about a little bit yesterday that that uh, this is this is stain really, you know, he's he is foundationally he's fundamentally bad right now and that's i mean he is the guy that must be stopped and so it's nice that we get to see that the hydrogen powered bus you know the hindenburg on wheels gives the passengers plenty of time to evacuate before tony is kicked into the side of it right (laughs) 
Well, and that's, you know, uh, to your point, uh, Julia, it's actually an interesting thing to discuss is this whole idea of collateral damage, because Tony obviously was concerned about the people in the car. And, you know, the, the filmmakers are showing we're concerned about the people in the bus. We want to make sure we show people leaving the bus. But Tony, who seems to be concerned about it, he also, you know, he blasts. Uh, Obadiah with his unibeam and he continues fighting. And when he hits him with the unibeam, he blasts him backward into another car. Now, I don't know if that person had gotten out of that car, but it, it's it's that same mentality. And, and uh, it's interesting that, that Tony is bringing up collateral damage. Um, and I guess it's just the way you're looking at it. But, you know, is he causing that same sort of stuff with the disregard of people's lives as he's, as he's fighting this guy? Or I, I don't know. Is there a difference there? I'm really not sure that there is a difference. You know, when Tony pushed uh, Obadiah back in that way, hitting another car, did he check to see if the car was empty? Did he check to see if there was someone still in it? Did he know that he was going to kill someone when he did that? I think if he did, if he honestly didn't know that there was somebody still in there that was going to die, that is legit collateral damage. But if he knew and he did it anyways... That is morally suspect. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see from Tony in a, in a morally perfect fight is that he actively tries to remove the fight from a public space. Like that he blasted away sooner and got out of there so that they could take their fight to somewhere where they weren't going to hurt people. But, you know, fighting like this, you, you don't have time to to check your morals you're just fighting yeah so sometimes even the good guy does stuff that's not great as much as tony would prefer for them to do this uh, like anime style where suddenly they're just snap your fingers in the middle of nowhere he's fighting for his life like obadiah wants to hurt tony and so tony could try and run away but he also doesn't want to leave pepper undefended so he's really in a tricky situation here and i'd like to think that tony's making the most of it doing the best he can <laughs> right <laughs> this minute may not be the best example of yeah that. making the most You're of right. it so far as he's having trouble getting off the ground yeah, yeah. this is not a great minute for him <laughs> yeah no very very little opportunities for him to actually look around and make sure okay i'm not i, I can hit that car <laughs> nobody's right. in it <laughs> maybe don't put this in the highlight reel <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the the filmmakers do. Uh, I think their work of of uh, showing, you know, we're not we're we're allowing these people to get out. So we want. So it's one of those things where it's like these people are escaping by the fact that we're showing it to you. It helps in a way make it feel like it's okay for Tony to to do more because in a way it's 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 like the filmmaker saying we're letting the audience know, and by virtue of that. Tony kind of knows that it's safer here now. It's it's one of those tricks that I think that they try to do to just make it feel like, okay, it's a safer environment now, so we'll be okay if more damage happens now. We go from uh, really kind of the end of this, we have the shoulder missile that, he, uh, that Obadiah <laughs> pops out of his shoulder and uses to target Tony. And obviously, he intends to use it as our minute comes to an end. Uh, but before we get to the end of the minute, we should talk a little bit about a deleted scene that we had here. Uh, this was a deleted scene that uh, did kind of tie Rhodey back in to the fight in a more direct way, where uh, Rhodey actually drives Tony's Audi R8 into Obadiah and kind of knocking Obadiah and the Ironmonger suit into the bus. And then they have their cute little exchange and all that. I don't know. I, I, I'm glad that it didn't play because I, I wasn't so convinced that it worked for me. What did you guys think of the deleted scene? It's hard for me to say because the, the whole idea is that, you know, Rhodey is coming to Tony's rescue. Tony is in a situation where he's literally getting stomped on. But just the way that the that the animatic works, where the Audi R8 plows into Obadiah's leg and Obadiah clumsily falls back into the bus and then makes it explode. It's just I think the movie is better served by just having Rhodey go straight to the Air Force. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, 
I don't know. The, the whole thing of getting him more involved like this, I just, I don't know. I, and granted, the effects weren't finished, so who knows? Maybe it would have worked better when Obadiah had fallen in, but it just, uh, I don't know. I think that it works so much better having Tony not have to be rescued by his friend also. I definitely agree with that, but there is something satisfying to watching the hydrogen-powered bus blow up. And I'm glad they kept that. <laughs> we still I'm get so to. glad they kept we that. We still get that, right? But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a little bit cheeky. You've got a problem. I'm running out of cars. Yeah. I think we were talking yesterday about how this was a fight between Tony and his old life of being a warmonger. And it's, 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 yeah, it's really Tony fighting himself and struggling to change and to overcome his past and become something better. And having this little, this help from Rhodey, I think kind of interrupts that flow. Right. That's a, that's a good point because, especially because Rhodey, we already know there's kind of this conflict with Rhodey and Tony because Rhodey is a representative of the military and, and having him all of a sudden kind of jump into this fight. It, it would have felt a little well, and he still is going to, but still there's like, it's, it's, it doesn't work so much for me as the turn for him to all of a sudden do that. I think it will make more sense when the way that they've actually worked it in, which we'll find out more tomorrow. Let's do it. Yeah. Do you guys have anything else for today's minute? No, I'm good. Yep. We're good. All right. Well, uh, would you guys like to remind everybody where they can find you and learn more about your show? Certainly. Uh, we told everybody to visit our main website yesterday, madmaxminute.com. But if you are the type of person that likes to be on social media, you can find us on Twitter. Our handle is at madmaxminute. And if you would like an easy way to keep up with everything that we post, every time we put something new on our website, it immediately gets posted to the Twitter. So you can turn those notifications on and get little ping alerts as soon as we start dropping content. So definitely check us out there at Mad Max Minute. Perfect. All right. Well, everybody, that's it for today's show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the show for free at marvelmovieminute.com. Join us over in our Discord chat room and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Next Reel. And if you like what we do and you want to support us and get some cool stuff, become a patron over at thenextreel.com slash Patreon. Until next time, true believers. Music.